Welcome to Let Me Ask You This. I'm your host, Tom. Thank you for joining me while I interview individuals about their life and their experience. If you like this show, please make sure you subscribe and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey guys, welcome to episode 28 of Let Me Ask You This. Today, I have Alex. Alex is a realtor. Um, known him a little bit through family, but actually got introduced to him through realty, real estate. Uh, so, Alex, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So, what, what what's the main thing that's going on with real estate right now? There's not enough houses for people who want to buy them, and that just keeps driving the prices up and up and up and up, and... You know, everyone keeps saying it's supposed to stop, it's gonna stop, it's gotta stop, and it doesn't stop because we just don't have enough houses to meet the demand. And there's a ton of factors we could get into on on why, but um, that's that's the general gist of it. Well, one thing that I see a lot, so we're, we're in New Hampshire. Um, one thing that I see a lot, I see a lot more condo flexes being built, or like, so you're seeing a lot of high-end stuff yeah. being built rather than affordable housing, which is definitely a contributing factor. You're seeing a lot of apartments getting converted to condos. I've started seeing that more, yep. even in rural New Hampshire. I just saw one in Pittsfield that was converted from apartments into individual condos, um, which in some ways that's nice because it gives houses that people can buy and own. In other ways, it takes away from the rental market that's already kind of suppressed. So um, it's it's uh, it's a challenge all the time. I work with a lot of first time home buyers, and I'm constantly running into people that are you know their budget just doesn't meet what they need, and there's just not enough options for for those people. And you see it every every day. You know, huge uh, huge uh, single family houses going up and luxury apartment conversions and stuff like that. So, you know, what we really need is some building of some affordable housing, which would, would change things a lot. So, but like, so housing has gone up, has land gone up? Has that been? Uh, it's definitely gone up because, you know, there's, land is typically used to build on, right? Yeah. Unless it's unbuildable for whatever reason, whether it be zoning or environmental issues. Um, but, it hasn't been in the way that homes have gone up, um, just for the sheer fact that not everybody can buy to build uh, buy a piece of land and build on it. Uh, the financing to do that is much harder. Okay. Um, when I first started getting into real estate, I was told you can't finance land. I've discovered that that's untrue. You can definitely get a loan on land, but it's harder to qualify for that. Um, it, it's definitely much harder. I've only had a few clients who could do that over the years. Um, but it is, it is possible. But then you've got to, you know, go through all the hurdles of, uh, if it's not a public water and sewer, you've got to drill a well, you've got to put in a septic system, you've got to develop your own road, essentially. And a lot of these land, you know, lots that are available now, they're, you know, way off of the road. You have to develop a road into it. And that's if the towns will even let you do it. A lot of these small towns in New Hampshire don't want a lot of new building because it puts strains on their services. and That explains know. a lot, actually, because, like, in Bedford, I've gone to places where it's just a straight road, and then there's, like, two houses off, and it's just a job. Yeah. yeah, and that probably all the town will allow them to develop. Um, some of these towns have gone to five-acre minimum lots. Um, Two-acre minimum, minimum lots is very common, so, and it's got to be set back a certain distance from your neighbor's yard and from the road, and, uh, there's a lot of restraints put on building. Um, some of it's for good reason, and you know, some of it's just sheer. These towns don't want to grow too fast, which I, it could be a good reason, depending on your perspective. Um, but you know, you see it all the time. If anybody talks about building affordable housing or apartment units in these small New Hampshire towns, and you go on the community Facebook pages, mm -hmm. people are pissed. I mean, they do not want that coming in their town because. That means people who are paying less taxes are going to have children who go to their school system. And yep. that puts the burden on the people who have the bigger houses. 
And, you know, it's the classic haves versus the have-nots, right? Yep. Um, and, and you just see it repeated over and over again. Uh, the biggest thing, I, I keep repeating this over and over again, is um, the census numbers came out not too long ago. It's been a while now. But um, 2010 to 2020, we had 5 million-ish new homes built, and the population grew 24 million. So you get a stick, almost five people, in every single house. Yeah. And a lot of single people are buying. Um, so it, it's... Um, it's, I don't see this changing anytime soon. No, he's just going to keep going up. Just I, I, I can't see anything that's going to stop it. You don't um, think it's just going to like eventually plateau? I've been. I would like to. I've been saying that for a while, but like, okay, it's going to flatten out. It's going to flatten out, and that would be ideal if we could just stop because you don't want to see people who have bought in the last couple of years losing their shirt. Yeah. You know. Um, but you don't want to see it stop at a point where eventually people's income will catch up to where they can become homeowners too. And um, it's just, I'm not seeing it happen, unfortunately. I've, uh, I've put in an offer this week um, that was 30 something thousand over asking and we didn't win. We weren't even in the consideration. Um, I had a call to get it. I tried to book a showing online for a property today. Mm -hmm that just, just listed yesterday, and it wasn't allowing me to book online, so I called the listing agent, and he goes, yeah, we're already under contract, you're not gonna believe the price I got for this house. And that's <laughs> still happening, I mean, we're two weeks from Christmas. This is the time, typically, people don't wanna move. Uh, I see, I've seen statistics, we use a, a software called Showing Time to book appointments for showings, okay. yep. and I've seen statistics out of there that this um, this month is the busiest it's ever been this That's time good. of year. And with way less to look at. So everyone's going out and seeing all these same houses. I had two, I just left a showing where I had two of my clients in the same day want to look at the same house because that's how little is out there. And it's not like I'm a very small piece of the, the market. You know? Yeah. That's, that's insane, especially because like right now, People, one, have been out of work because of COVID. And two, it's Christmas time. Normally people are like buying gifts, and, but people are like, no, oh, buying houses right now. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you say, you know, people out of work for COVID, but my, my busiest time period last year were the six or eight weeks, whatever it was, that New Hampshire was, you know, under stay-at-home orders. Um, were my busy, was my busiest time. Um, and, and something that's happened, you know, uniquely to, to New England, you know, the whole country's seeing these same things, yeah. right? But um, New England, is, or especially New Hampshire, is in this unique area where we're just outside the major cities, mm -hmm. New York, Boston, and people don't have to go to their offices anymore. Occasionally, you may have to go in, like, even, even people from New York that work in, for New York companies... Are moving up here because they might only have to go to the office once a month they can go get a hotel room in new york city for a night and save all kinds of money living up here uh you're seeing people sell their houses in queens for a million and a half and buy <laughs> double the house up here for seven hundred thousand. you know so um uniquely to new hampshire we have a lot of people coming in from out of state uh, because of our proximity to those big cities and the fact that we are actually more affordable to live, even though if you're here, it's, it seems like it's out of reach for some people. Uh, but we're we're still more affordable than those big city metro areas. Yeah, and to like kind of put it into perspective, because when some people hear New Hampshire, they think, oh, it's all up near me. We're only six hours away from New York City. Like, yeah, I, mean, I could hop in the car right now and go to New York City and be there by midnight. Oh, easily, yeah. 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 So it's not that far. So that's one hundred. And, and we're sitting here in Manchester. We're an hour from Boston. Exactly. So yeah. and plenty of people. I mean, I've I've talked to people who work in Boston and tell me they'll drive up to an hour and a half to work. Now, part of that is because they don't have to go every day anymore. Yeah. But you know, yeah, it's. I it's, could do that if if they're like, yeah, you gotta come in once a month. Okay, and I would, yeah, no problem. I would, yeah, hour and a half every day once yeah. a month. Okay, deal. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's mostly just for, you know, meetings that can't be done on Zoom or whatever. And even you, you hear more and more and more that 
companies are just realizing that they don't need people to come in. Everything can be handled by email. Everything can be handled on the phone. You know. Yeah, I'm I'm loving this digital age that we have because we we the military was learning that on my way out because of COVID. With HVAC, you can't really do that because you have to be in person yeah, for that. You have to fix but, the heating system on site. Although someday you may be able to control a lot of stuff from remotely. You know, there may be well, there, there's, there's like systems and stuff that you can pretty much log into and you can see what every single thing is doing in the system yeah. and it will read every single temperature like throughout where so you, you can diagnose a problem yeah. before you even got there you yep. can show up with the parts and yeah and that that stuff is cool but besides that i don't want anything more than that that i you don't want a robot next nope. to everybody's system that you can control from your laptop no yeah I mean, it could I happen. Like my it job. could happen, though, right? It could, one hundred percent. But yeah. I like my job. Yeah, this is this is a hobby. Jobs, are jobs. <laughs> so, when when I was starting to look for a house, you told us not to use Zillow. I, I remember that, correct? And that's because a lot of times you see it on Zillow, it's like gone already. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily say. I mean, I, I may have said that, but um, you know, you can look anywhere you want. Yeah. Um, it's all the same stuff, but it goes into what's called the MLS system, the multiple listing service. Okay. Um, that's where it goes first. Every realtor, when they get a listing, it goes on the multiple listing service. And as realtors, we can plug you into a system that will update you as soon as something within your criteria hits that system. Now, Zillow and Realtor.com and Redfin, and they get all those listings. It might be 20 minutes later. It's not that, you know, it used to be slow. Yeah. Now it's pretty instantaneous. Um, my biggest gripe with Zillow, and it, like I, I'm not a Zillow hater. Like some of the some of the people in my industry, it's like Zillow is the evil, it's the devil. Um, but like my biggest gripe is a lot of the stuff they post is a little bit misleading, um, as far as foreclosure listings and pre foreclosure listings, um, and they kind of bury like if stuff is under contract already, like already buyer is is buying it, they kind of bury that information. Because what they do is sell leads. They, okay. they, basically, as a realtor, I can go to Zillow and say, I want thirty three percent of your leads in O three one O three, which I think that's where we're sitting right now. 03103. Yeah, O three one O three. Yeah. So in that zip code, um, and every so every third, if I own thirty three percent of their share, every third client that goes and wants, to, or every third uh, home shopper that goes on Zillow and searches in that zip code and wants to see a house, that person will get sent to me. And I have to pay Zillow monthly for that right. Mm. Um, and they charge big money um, for that. Where in the old days, if you were the listing agent, mm -hmm. most likely that uh, that person was gonna come directly to you because you were the one marketing the property. And so now Zillow's sucking leads out of the marketplace. Okay. And then selling them back to us, um, which it's fair. I'm, we're this is a capitalist society. Yeah, I didn't invent it. I don't like, but this is this is capitalism. It's that's a good how, boy. It's that's good. how it works, you yeah. know. Um, so that's why I mean I don't hate on Zillow for that, um, but they make it look like you're contacting like the listing agent, and really you're not. You're just getting and whenever you are on, you know, I I have um, I have a relationship with Redfin. Um, and what I'm on, if somebody calls me from Redfin, about 50% of the time they assume I'm the listing agent, they immediately start asking me questions about the property <laughs> that I probably don't know anything about unless I've already looked at it with yeah. a client, you know? Um, so it's, it's good and bad for the consumer. Um, it makes sure that the consumer has somebody to get a hold of all the time because a lot of times as a listing agent, you list a property and you've got nonstop calls for three, four days. You're gonna miss some people, unfortunately. Yep. That happens. Um, you can't get to everybody. You can't show it. Uh, I can't show. A, I, I've had houses have a hundred showings in three days. I can't That's show. A lot. I can't do that. I can't no. show it to a hundred people. I could, but what, what other life would I have? What I wouldn't be taking care of my other business. No. You know. So it's good and bad for the consumer. Um, I think as long as people understand how it works, it's fine. You know. Um, so I, you know, I try not to be a Zillow hater. Like some some of the people, literally, like it's just everything's evil. 
you know, don't use Zillow, don't give them your money. And like, hey, if that's how you want to make your business by buying Zillow leads, then by all means do it, you know. But I, I've personally choose to work by, you know, a lot of word of mouth and get a reputation. I try to treat people as well as I can. And that always turns into more business for me. I mean, I've 100% told, I told my, I mean, people, I don't know why they didn't use you. I'm kind of mad they didn't. They didn't even like their realtor. They kept complaining about it. And I was like, yo, go use this guy. Happens all the time. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, wow, this girl's such a bitch. I'm like, go use this guy. <laughs> and they're like, wow, I really hate this girl. I'm like, why are we still having this conversation? Well, but, unfortunately, people, um, you know, one, one of the things that, Realtors do is they sign you into a buyer agency agreement, okay, which says you will work with that agent no matter what you're doing in real estate, basically. Hmm. Um, and we do have to do those um, to have, as at least my company requires my my old company didn't require me to do this, but my company requires me to sign you up as an agent with an agency agreement once we're going to make an offer on a house, okay. Um, but if anybody ever came to me and said, hey, I don't want to work with you anymore, this isn't working out, I would tear that agency agreement right up and let them walk away. Um, some agents try to hold people to that and won't let them out of their contracts. And I think it's ridiculous because if somebody doesn't want to work with you, why are you, for, why are you yeah. forcing them to? And I've seen a lot of people just give up on their house search because they didn't want to work with that agent anymore. And, and the way things have been, like I've had people come to me after going through that. Like I had a couple, I remember I told them, I said, hey, just ask to get out of the contract. And they like, for whatever reason, they didn't want to do it. And they just waited six months for the contract to run out. Meanwhile, house prices went up 10%. Yeah. You know, they lost a lot of money because of that. So um, I, I just, I think it's ridiculous to try to force somebody into a contractually working with me. Basically, at the end of the day, if I do my job and I treat you right, you're most likely going to work with me. And then the only th it's backfired on me one time where I was at a wedding overnight. Somebody called me first thing in the morning when I woke up. I was two hours away, and uh, I was like, look, I can't show the property right now. When I yeah. get back in the afternoon, I can't. That'd be ridiculous. And yeah. they got upset, and they went and saw it with somebody else and bought it with somebody else. But, you know, that only happened, this only happened to me one time in four years. I can't complain. No. That in I don't, like forcing somebody to work with you. That I feel like that that'd be a way to get less customers. Because I think so. One one hundred percent because you're not you're not really showing customer service right. like satisfaction. Yeah. In at the end of the day, it's all about it's, what's best for uh, you know the person trying to shop for a house. I as an agent, you should not make it more more difficult on the person shopping. That's yeah, I get that. That's the way I look at it. Like, if whatever is gonna work for you, go do it. If that means I don't make money, that means I don't make money. That's that's my bottom line every day. And by doing that, by acting that way, I feel like my I've gotten lots of clientele by because people tr know they, they they trust me. They know that I'm not out to just make money off them. I'm there to genuinely help them get to where they want to be. And if that means they're not buying a house that's fine that means if we're backing out that's fine too you know um, I've done a lot of work for for clients and had them just back out of the transaction and it is what it is you know if they're if they I'd rather I'd rather walk away and make no money than have you hate me in six months yeah because you but went into something you shouldn't have that's how I always look at it so you you would you, you brought up like how if you don't make money, a lot of people might not know, how does we have to make money? We only make money when we close. So um, as a listing agent, we negotiate with the seller uh, for how much commission, it's a percentage usually, um, how, what percentage of this purchase price we're gonna take. Um, and you do that before you even put it on the market, you negotiate. Um, and I, I try to be reasonable with that. I'm not the most expensive person out there, but I also, I'm not giving away my services because I am proud of the job I do and I do a good job for people. Um, but it's always negotiable. Uh, I mean, no you look crazy do. hours too sometimes. Oh, yeah. So well, I, I get it. Yeah. It, it's a fun, it must be a fun job. And then um, as a buyer's agent, typically you're getting a cut of whatever that listing agent negotiated with the seller. Okay. Um, some buyer's agents do 
um, charge an additional fee on top of that. I never do that. I've only ever had one buyer ever pay me out of their pocket. It was just because we were negotiating something that was off market and there was, there was no commission being offered yeah. by the seller. Um, but other than that, I usually just take whatever the seller's offering, which is, it tends to be two to 3%, but it could, it could be anything. You know, it's a, it's a completely negotiable uh, thing on the, on the listing agent's side. So when they, when they negotiate for whatever amount that they negotiate for, then they also tell the seller, I'm going to offer the buyer's agent an amount to okay. out, of, out of that. That makes sense. And then, yeah, really, we, we, don't, we don't make a dime. We drive around, look at property with people for free uh, until, <laughs> until they buy something. I mean, that's, it, that's fun. I mean, it, like you said, it is fun. I, I would rather personally, there's two things that real estate agents do. We either drive around, look at stuff with people and talk to people, mm-hmm. or we sit at our desk trying to find people to look at stuff and talk to. So I'd rather just be driving around looking at stuff than sitting at my desk trying to find people to look at stuff with. That's what, 100%. That's my no, on it. Same behind desk is no fun. No. No. So how does one become a real estate agent? Is it it's different very, for every state? Every state's different. Okay. New Hampshire is extremely easy, um, in my opinion. Um, I've, I've seen people struggle with it, so I shouldn't say it's that easy. But uh, it's a 40-hour course, uh, and then you take a test. Um, you get criminally background checked by the state, uh, apply, and you have to... I can't remember all the specifics. I think I had to have like three personal references signed for me and had to be notarized and like things like that. They want to make sure you're a good person. Okay. Um, not, a, you know, you're not a criminal and not dangerous, like an upstanding person. In this, in, because you're meeting people alone. Yeah. A lot of times in empty buildings, you're going in, you're getting keys to people's houses. Um, so, you know, they want to make sure that you're a decent person. Then you have to have some understanding of real estate law and process. I will tell you, the, the 40 hour course they make you take does not prepare you for doing the job. No. You really need a mentor when you start. Um, somebody that basically will hold your hand through the process because they don't teach you how to fill out a contract. You know, the, the main thing we do is to make money is write contracts. They don't even teach you how to do that in the class. So it's, it's in the book, but it just gets flipped through. Um, and you know. So what's the point of the class? It's a, it's fundamentals of you know the kind of the basics of real estate law and like a lot of like scare tactic stuff of like this is how not to get sued type okay. of stuff. Um, you know, a lot of the the, the fair housing laws are, are pretty important that, that you learn and some ethics stuff. And but yeah, to do day to day real estate, and they don't teach you how to generate business either. That's the main thing. And then you go to, unfortunately, most real estate training after you get your license is only on how to get business. It's not how to do a good job for that business. It's just to find <laughs> people to work with. So there's a lot of like, there's it's a lot like of- It's how you get clientele, customers. but doesn't mean you're gonna be good. Yeah. I, so I remember hearing a story about um, somebody going to work at one of the big brokerages and he gets a buyer Goes and shows the buyer a property, mm-hmm. and the buyer wants to write an offer on a property. He has no idea how to write an offer, so he goes in the office, and he's running around to everybody asking them. To, nobody would help him. Nobody would help him write an offer. He had no idea what to do. You know, fine. I think eventually he found somebody, but it's like you're really not prepared when you get out of that class. Yeah. You, you really the biggest thing I recommend is somebody don't go just to the big brokerage because they're offering a good commission split or they have all these fancy tools or whatever. You need somebody that's going to help you one-on-one. And I, I'm blessed to work for, even now, I'm, I'm, I need help sometimes, you know. Um, Everybody and, needs help sometimes. Yeah, and I have, um, I have an awesome broker who, who anytime, pick up the phone, call her, she'll walk me through any anything that I need help with. Or if, you know, she doesn't know the solution, we'll figure it out together and, um, it's really, you need somebody like that. And you, you don't always get that at some of the big big chains, I feel like. Although I've only worked at small ones, so I should, probably shouldn't talk. <laughs> but um, that's what I hear anyways. So, besides real estate, what are the hobbies that you have? I wish I had hobbies lately, man. Like, I, I just work, work, work. I got a four-year-old. I'm pretty um, sure I saw you playing a 
guitar the other day. Yeah, I, I yeah. did. I, I, I played in a band called Yellow Stitches for a long time. Um, I wasn't. Uh, I, I quit the band five years ago. Okay. But they asked me to do a show we did at the Shaskeen. Um, I had a great time. I would actually like to play more um, now that I did it. But uh, still sounds good. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I'm I'm not a musician. It's the weird like, I years and years ago, uh, almost almost twenty years ago now, um, my friend Josh was like, "Hey, I want you to play bass in this band." I'm like, "I've never played an instrument." And I'm like, no, I don't know. He, no, don't worry about it. I can teach you. And he sat there with his guitar, and he's like, "Okay, put your finger here, hit this string. Put your finger here, hit this string." until I knew all the songs and then uh, that, that band was called Drug Test we did that for uh, I don't know two or three years and then uh, years later uh, me and my friend um, the captain as people know him um, decided we would start Yellow Stitches and uh, Yellow Stitches really took off um, and I played a lot of bass with Yellow Stitches <laughs> for sure um, but yeah man, I I I, I like uh, I get into different things all the time. Uh, my most recent hobby was uh, swimming, actually. Yeah. Um, last yeah, last year I was um, training with a bunch of crazy uh, triathlete people. Um, so like fresh water? Yeah, I did. I did. I ended up doing an open water lake race. Oh, okay. Uh, That's but cool. we, were, we were doing. Uh, I was doing pool swims to train at the Y, and uh, yeah, a bunch of. Um, they do the, the the guy that ran the the daily um it was like three days a week actually that we had swim class or i don't know what you what you call it but um practice i guess yeah. um and this guy uh phil he does a event called swim with a mission um which is a, a veterans charity they they raise a lot of money for different things i know they've done um a lot of the service dogs for disabled veterans okay and, yeah and um they they donated it to the VA center here and like oh, I think they opened a library or something in the, in the uh -huh. they did done a lot of different veterans charities so I I trained with them and then I I just I just stumbled upon them because they were doing it at the Y um, and then I heard about this charity and I ended up signing up and swimming in it and um, I did I they do a thousand meter a five thousand meter and a ten thousand yeah, I only did the thousand um, <laughs> but yeah ten I mean ten Ten meter, ten thousand meters is uh, seven, some seven point four miles, I think. Is that right? Yeah, because a, a yeah. five five k is three point two, right? Yes. So so, no, six point six point four. Six point four. Is that right? Yeah, six point four. But anyway, either way, a ah, hell of a lot of swimming. I'm terrible, uh, man. Some of these, some of the people yeah. I trained with did did that long swim, so uh, it was cool to see. It was cool to be a part of that, but. I fell off. I fell off the wagon. I haven't been swimming lately, but that was my most recent hobby. I'm always, I always get into some sort of fitness thing. I did a um, pro MMA fight back in 2006. What? Yeah, yeah. Um, Club Club Lido. It was Combat Combat Zone, which is still around. Okay. It was like Combat Zone 17. I think they're up to Combat Zone like 100 and something now. Um, but yeah, I. Uh, I it was it was weird. It was like in the real early days of it really blowing up. Like That's I don't you crazy. ever see the show The Ultimate Fighter? Yeah. So the first season of Ultimate Fighter came out and I like binge watched it. I'm like, I wanna do that. And I was just like <laughs> I probably wasn't even Google at the time. It was probably like Alta Vista or something. Maybe Google was around back then. Whatever search engine I was using, yeah. maybe Yahoo. But I was just like, MMA, you know, New Hampshire and I found uh this team Team Woo. Uh, yeah, Roger Wu was a coach, and uh, they trained out of team. Uh, it's Team Lake now in uh, in Hookset. Okay. Uh, Tokyo Joe Studio Self Defense is where it's at, um, but they're they're Team Lake now, which is affiliated with Gabriel Gonzaga, who was a UFC fighter. Mm -hmm. um, and they've they've actually had guys go to the UFC, and they've they've had a lot of Bellator and uh, one of the a lot of the big promotions, um, Invicta. Um, a lot of those fighters you see on UFC Fight Pass now, uh, but yeah, I trained trained with those guys and did did one pro MMA fight. I'm undefeated. Uh, <laughs> but Congratulations! Yes, thank you. I, I love I love telling people I'm undefeated pro fighter. Yeah, hey, retire when you're on top. Yeah, that was just like what was uh, Habib? Um, 
I can't ever pronounce his name. I, yeah, he was... Nurmer getting something, something like that. But, uh, I guess, he, but he, he retired undefeated, and I was like, big deal. I retired undefeated like a yeah. decade ago, you know? That's what. what. What's one fight compared to what? 40-something, yeah, I think he exactly. had? It's all just still yeah. undefeated. Undefeated means undefeated. Okay, it's a great. I ran a marathon a couple years ago. So like, yeah, hob- hobbies. Like, I'm always like, I'm always doing something, something stupid. Like, I would never run a man- marathon. I said that too, and then it was like, you know, I, I, what, I was like, what's a challenge that I would never do? Like, and, <laughs> and then I kind of thought to myself, I'm like, if I could do this, I could do anything. And here I am, out of shape and overweight again. But yeah. um, yeah. it happens. Yeah. COVID happened to me big time. <laughs> I let I let the COVID beat me. Yeah, Kobe was rough on a lot of people, yeah. but that's what happens. I am, I, I started doing jiu-jitsu, and I now lift a lot more than what I used to. So, I, can, I can tell you look. Yeah, I, I've, sure. gained, I've gained 30 pounds since I've gotten nice. out of the military, so that's Like, great. in a good way? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah I'm yeah. trying to. I, I want to get up to 170, um, maybe 190, maybe, I don't know, that, that's a push. But 170 is my goal because being fit's okay. I promise. Some people forget that. Yeah. 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 I take vitamins now. And That's good. Yeah, and I'm gonna. I I already eat somewhat healthy. That's but my biggest I, problem. I still don't eat. I I take in a lot of bad sugars. I know that, and I want to fix that. So we're gonna start eating healthier. But I need to eat more and healthier, yeah. and that's the issue. It's hard to eat. Gaining yeah. weight and eating healthy at the same time is a hard thing. Because so trust me, I can sit down with cosmic brownies all day or yeah. the Christmas those, trees those and just the shove them in my face. But, yeah, I might get big, but I also get diabetes, and I don't want diabetes. Yeah. So I'm trying to avoid that. I'm trying to avoid all the terrible... Jiu-Jitsu is where I lost the most weight in really? my life. Like, I lost, like, 100 pounds doing Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, well, then I gained it all back, but um, <laughs> but yeah, jujitsu will, will take some weight off. It's hard 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 to keep some weight on uh, keep the weight on when you're friggin' doing uh, aerobics and pajamas. I guess you know? that's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean wrestling wasn't. I, I made wrestling terrible for me because I I wore just layers of sweatpants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, if I didn't do that, if I just wore shirts and a t-shirt. What size? Did you, what weight did you wrestle at? Um. In high school, I, I did 126, and I was 126 all throughout my high school career. And did, I wrestled 132 a couple times. Did you times. have to cut for that? Yeah, I one time I cut 10 pounds in one day. I did. I did 17. I'm a lot bigger than you, so it's probably about the same ratios, right? About. Like, but I did. Uh, yeah, I did 17 for a jujitsu tournament. And, man, I felt terrible though. I, I had no like no. Buddy telling me how to do it, I just wung it, you know, and I just I felt so bad. The way the weigh-ins were first thing in the morning, uh, and my first match though wasn't till like mid afternoon. Those are the so, worst, but the best. So yeah, I was just guzzling. Like I think I gained fifteen pounds before I got into a match. That's what a lot of like UFC fighters do. Though. Well, at least they get day before weigh-ins. When I when I fought, we were doing same day weigh-ins. And a lot of people weren't weight cutting, but I remember seeing Joe Lazan. It was either Joe or Dan Lazan. I don't remember. They both went on. Two brothers went on to fight in the UFC. Um, but I remember watching one of them get carried onto the scale, like put on the scale. That's disgusting. When he was done, they threw him in a chair, stuck Pedialyte in his face. He guzzled two bottles of Pedialyte and fought like four hours later. That's disgusting. He couldn't even so dehydrated he couldn't even walk, and then he fought and won. I was like, I mean, those guys were. That's a skill. Yeah, they're animals. It's a I remember Tito Ortiz, skill. was like, his average weight cut was like 20 pounds. And he would gain like 18 of it back by the time he got in the cage the next day. Yeah, Con- uh, Conor McGregor is going up to heavyweight. Heavy? Yeah, he's 190 right now. And then. He's going to go to 225? I, I think that's what he wants. He's talking about. Is it 225? Now? I think that's. The oh, next. no, it's two, over 205, right? Light heavyweight's 205. I believe 205 so. 205 to 265 is heavyweight. I believe so. There, there's so many different. I have a. Yeah, they, they have different weight classes from what I was doing it now. Uh, 
Light heavyweight is 178. Oh, 165 to 178. I don't think that's well, that's so, that's boxing weight divisions. You have, why? I'm I'm in UFC weight is. classes. <laughs> it's still giving you boxing. That's funny. I bet if you Google's play, broken. I bet if you put that. Of course, Carlos Ringer is the first one. Well, yeah, because he's the one that everybody's talking about right now. Yeah, light heavyweight is two hundred five to two or is two hundred five max. Heavyweight is two sixty five max. That's pretty yeah, much the same. So yeah, he's. They had it. We didn't have uh, back when I was doing it. We didn't have anything under light weight. Like one fifty five was a minimum. I remember seeing a guy weigh in like full, like decked out in clothes, and then like chain <laughs> like a roll of quarters in his pocket. I, I weighed in with all my clothes on because I I couldn't keep the weight on. I was training so hard. I weighed in one time with, like, clothes on, and that was because they were bumping me up a weight class, and I needed to weigh more yeah. because I wasn't, I wasn't close. To, they they were bumping me up two weight classes actually, so I needed to get into the next weight class for them to do that. I fought under U.S. kickboxing rules, so my weight class I want to say was was light heavyweight at. 200 or no we couldn't be over 210 um but and i was like 201 and losing going into like i couldn't keep the weight on i was just training so hard and i was like fully clothed and like i weighed in at 201 my opponent weighed in at like 205 like we weren't dialed in <laughs> we weren't dialed in at all for our weights like we probably both could have fought at a lower weight class but whatever it happens yeah, I want to get back into the UFC. I keep seeing it, and I'm just like, man, I would love to watch it, but I, I even have ESPN Plus. I was gonna say the pay per views killed me, but if you have ESPN Plus, you get to watch well, a lot of it. The bundle, we have the Disney, Hulu, and ESPN Plus. But every time I go to watch it, it's, I can't ever one find live stuff, and two, it's always just. Just clips. It's not full fights. Gotcha. So like even like the like the recaps. There's there's recaps. They don't have like full fights. I just burnt myself out because I used to watch so much of it. Like UFC, King of the Caves. Like I I used to watch all these smaller promotions. Like any DVDs I could find. Like I used to just watch fights like all day, eight hours a day. And I, I mean, just, I just I burnt they're, myself out. They're exhilarating. It. It's fun. Yeah. It's Every fight is different. It's yeah, now every once in a while, like, somebody I know, like, from the, the guys I used to train with, um, somebody on that team will fight, and I'll, I'll turn it on and watch it. And it's it's so exciting, but I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't have the same passion for it that I used to. No, it's, it, I, I've no it's gone, it's gone in waves, like, with everything. Like, the, the UFC is strange, because... They're the only, like, major company that didn't really, sh like, TV corporation that didn't fully shut down during COVID. Oh, yeah. So, they were, because... Yeah, they figured out how to do it. Yeah, and they, the, uh, they, they, they announced the shutdown, and then two weeks later, or Fight, not even... Fights in empty arenas were weird, though. Yeah, like, you could hear, it was... Yeah. It was empty, like... One of the one of the guys I I know that that fights uh, locally uh, fought John Gotti Jr. during the shutdown. Really? Or, is it Jr. or the third? John Gotti the third. 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 Yeah, and uh, they were saying that like there was a, there was no audience, but John Gotti the third had his audience there. <laughs> he, he was he, he was allowed to bring his people. Well, it's weird because like. Uh, I don't know how many people have actually been in an empty arena, but it already it's very echoey as it is, and so one with nobody in it except for really the fighters and the people like around the stage, it's one a lot of empty space that just echoes. So I did love how you could hear the impacts because I think a lot a lot of with all the noise, 
a lot of it's lost how brutal fighting actually is. Like, I mean, these guys, when you tape up somebody's hand and stick it, stick that glove on it, you're not padding that fist, really. No. You're protecting their hand. Yeah. But their hand pretty much turns into a baseball bat with a little tiny leather glove on it. Because that hand wrap makes it tighter. Yeah, pretty much. And yeah. people don't realize, and these guys can punch. Like, everyone's, most people have been punched in their life, but being punched by somebody who practices punching every single day and has been doing that for years is way different than getting in your schoolyard scrap. And, and I, I don't know. think people realize how hard these guys are punching. And then kicks. Like, that's a literally, your shin, that's a baseball like bat coming people's to your shin head. shins shatter sometimes, like, yeah. with how hard they kick. But, like, Brock, like, I know Brock Lesnar isn't, like, a normal-sized person, but him He's punching rich. you in the face was equivalent to a baby hippo sitting, like, sitting on a, like, I remember that fact so well because it frightened me. Because I feel like that could crush a normal person's skull. I remember after my fight, I, I had taken a little time off, and I came back to the gym, and there was this guy, Paul, getting ready to, uh, to, to fight, and they're like, oh, great. Good to have a heavyweight back um, because Paul Paul's been having to spar with a lot of little people. I'm like, guys, I'm not ready. Like, I'm not, I'm not in shape. I'm not, I'm not ready to spar. I just want to work out. No, 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 you'll be fine. Spar. This dude knocks me out in like 30 seconds, like out cold. It's like this is that's with full, yeah. you know, uh, we're wearing 16 ounce sparring gloves and kid Kate out and KO. This kind of what. That's funny, we've been talking about this and I just, on my phone, I yeah. just see that uh, guy I used to train with here, he's uh, he's rolling with BJ Penn right now, or the guy right now, <laughs> he, knows. He, uh, he moved to Hawaii and started going to BJ Penn's place, I guess BJ showed up today. That's pretty cool, yeah. being able to just, this place that you normally go and roll and just... Be, be freaking BJ Penn shows up. Yeah. Probably one of the greatest but yeah no the, but the UFC um well, oh no we were talking about how being able to switch it off but it's not really like you said I never really thought of it like that because I haven't really like been like in a fight that I haven't wanted to like right. just wreck the next person because I hate them so I, I guess I get what you so, mean to me I wanted to go into my fight calm yeah and stick to strategy because like when you're training you're not angry and like you just want to take what you did in training and do it in the cage mm -hmm. so like uh to me that's i want to be calm like i would i remember my opponent walked by me while i was having dinner i was having a big rotisserie chicken yeah and uh i was like hey steve you want some chicken <laughs> and like he was just like you know face to the ground like didn't want to look at me like he was just trying to stay angry stay in that zone and i was just like perfectly calm i was listening to johnny cash all day you know like i wasn't i wasn't trying to get all fired up like i i had uh ringworms you know some heavy stuff for my uh for my entrance music just for fun but like i wasn't trying to get amped up like that it's different different people are different like I, i've seen a lot of guys get ready for fights and they're just in all kinds of different zones and then like um i trained with this one guy vic who who's uh a, you know um uh, I can't think of an Iraq veteran, Afghanistan veteran, like, you know, did a few tours over, over the Middle East during the wars, and, like, he he was calmer than I was. And I was like, man, how are you so relaxed going into this? <laughs> he's like, dude, nobody's going to shoot me today. Yeah. And I was like, true, good, good, fair point, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But, no, so what I used to do for wrestling... Uh, it would always depend on who, like, who the opponent was. Because sometimes, like, I would have to amp myself up, but then other times, I was like, okay, technique is where I need to be. I don't need to be angry. And so, because when... If if you don't really pay too much attention to what you're doing, you lose the technique. And so, that's a good way to always just slip up, because... I personally think technique is always better than just brute strength. Oh, for us, absolutely. But 
Isn't there a fight? Oh, no, the fight was last weekend. It there, was. Uh, there's so many. I can't keep track of it. There's somebody always fighting. <laughs> it's like they put on so many events now. I remember, like, a UFC used to be, like, a big deal. Like, it was, like, a once-a-quarter thing, like, to have a UFC event. Now it's, like, every other weekend. There's, yeah, the, there's fights. I remember, I don't know, two, three years ago, maybe two they were only in the 100s or not even and now they're almost in 300 yeah, for the they, pay-per-views fast, yeah. they, they have a fight almost once a month now and it's crazy because most fighters don't fight until a year after a fight they normally have off of Depend, fight. yeah it depends on how you know how the fight went down and you know that all the rankings and whatnot but yeah they can have a lot of time a lot of downtime but we can fight quite a lot. I just saw some guy, his record, and this isn't a UFC guy, but a, a pro guy whose record was like, I don't know, 40 and like 200 and something. Like the guy had like hundreds <laughs> of fights under his belt. Like I'm like, man, this guy's fighting like every month and losing a lot. Like. Maybe he's just getting paid to throw the fights. Hey, man. I doubt that, but he probably just likes the little paycheck every month. You know, you fight that often, you probably make a living out of it. Like, yeah, even, that's even, true. even as a losing fighter. Yeah. Man, that'd be. Get paid just to get punched in that's the a, face. That's a tough way to make a living, man. Yeah. No thanks. It's just. I mean, even the training, though, the training's hard. I will say, unless if you don't train. I'm sure he trains. <laughs> I went to some semi-pro boxing the other week. I was going to say the other day. It wasn't the other day. It was like a month ago. Yeah. Um, my buddy who boxes, he was like, hey, you want to go to a fight? And I was like, well, hold up. Are we fighting someone? Because he didn't, like, explain anything <laughs> to me. Was, you like, never you know. Wanna? Yeah, he was like, you want to go to a fight? I was like, I'll be a little old just to be, like, fighting random people. He's like, no, no, it's a boxing fight. And I was like, all right, sure. We can go. And so it was amateur and... I haven't, the, we, we were just in a hotel room, like, not like in a hotel, but like in a event room yeah, in a yeah, hotel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've been in a lot of fights in places like that. Yeah. yeah, and so like, there wasn't a lot of space, and the energy in there was crazy, yeah. and I've been to a UFC fight, and I felt more like energy and people so excited about this boxing match than like... Well, like, when I saw Conor McGregor fight in Boston. Yeah, I mean, people go to UFC because, like, just, you know, to say they went. Yeah. Like, people, if you go to a small-time, you know, amateur fights or, like, mixed, you know, sometimes they have mixed cards where it's pro and amateur, you go to the, everyone's there because they really care. Mm -hmm. Like, everyone is, a, almost everybody in the room is a fighter themselves. Or, like, you know, the, there was actually almost a fight fighters. in front of us. Like, people would talk, like, the two sides would talk and shit. Like, the families. Not yeah, even, like, yeah. the fighters. The families of the fighters were talking shit. And there was almost a fight between them. I I hate that that stuff, that stuff happens. Because, like, I just feel like, like, I, it's weird. Like, it doesn't bother me when people fight over, like, soccer. Yeah. Or football. Or, like. But when people fight over fights, I'm like, no. That's like, the fighting goes on inside the cage. Can't doing it. Like, let's like... be civilized because, like, I don't know, I just came from a time period where, like, when I, when I started, it was borderline legal. Like, yeah. when I did it, you know? Uh, it was just, like, we didn't have unified rules. There was different, there were a lot of, like, controversy. It wasn't legal everywhere yet. And um, because of what happened early on with UFC where it was like legalized dog fighting amongst humans, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, so I, I always like wanted to treat the sport with like a lot more respect than to, to fight and talk shit. And like, <clears throat> I never, I never really liked Conor McGregor or Ronda Rousey or uh, going way back, Tim Sylvia and Tito yeah. Ortiz. Like I never liked that shit talk that like be mean to your opponent like I, I always thought it should be, all be about respect and like if honestly if that person is gonna get in there and say yeah try to punch my face off I, or, I owe them respect you know yeah <clears throat> and I think everybody excuse me I think everybody around it should give it that same respect and like the fighting should only go on in the cage it should be all handshakes after it should be nothing but respect and love for each other. Um, that's how I've always felt about the sport, but, uh, you know, it's evolved into beyond that. I think, I think when it was newer, 
there were a lot more like martial artists and it was a lot more like nerds really. Well yeah and now, and now there's a lot of jocks. And involved now it's in, almost you know? like almost people like that came from football show. backgrounds. I mean like yeah. John Jones, like I mean his he's in a sports family, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's it's almost like a reality yeah. show, and oh, they they love getting them talking shit on each other in those interviews. Well, it, it brings in money. People yeah. love controversy because that. I mean, that's like I just the, like a good competition of skill between a couple skilled people that trained really hard to do it. Yeah, I don't watch any other post interviews. Yeah, I don't need anything. it. I don't need anything. I don't watch the weigh ins. I. I, I hear these people are fighting on this day, and I'm like, I want to watch that. I either do or I don't, or I watch it the next day. I got. I went to the weigh-ins for um, McGregor uh, and Diaz too. Mm -hmm. I just happened to be in Vegas, and <laughs> I was like, literally, I was just drinking in the pool, and I walked out, and this whole crowd of people were flooding into this big conference room or whatever and I was like oh what's this so I just <laughs> no, I'm at the UFC weigh-ins this is great I was still soaked from the pool uh, this is cool all the yeah all the all the Irish fans that were there were like chanting and waving flags so yeah I went it to was, it was intense the weigh-ins were more intense than any fight I've ever been to I, I saw Conor McGregor fight in Boston the same night that the Patriots won the championship to go to the Super Bowl oh that's perfect and it was the fight before he fought Aldo, so like yeah. when he jumped into this like yeah. stands and like yeah, got in his yeah, face yeah, yeah. so the garden was already wild up because of Conor McGregor and then right after that they thought it was a great idea to announce that the Patriots are going to the Super Bowl so now you have all these drunk yeah. people who are all fought up over an Irish man winning a fight now they're happy that the Patriots won. Yeah. And then when we left, just Boston was crazy. It, it took almost two hours to get out of Boston from the Garden. And the Garden's on the border. Like, it's right there. Mm -hmm. It was stupid. It was stupid. But we are getting to a little over an hour. So, would you like to promote any of your stuff? Well, um, my website's um, alexlachance.realtor. Real easy. Real easy. Um, I work for East Key Realty. It's an awesome company. If you're thinking of getting, getting into real estate, talk to me. I'm, uh, I'm always happy to help people get started. And uh, I think I work for a great company that I love to bring people on board with. And, yeah, if you just need any help in real estate or uh, anything really housing-related, Anything, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, my number is 603-731-7423. Uh, I'm always happy to, to help people out with anything. All right, and all that will be in the description. Um, and like I said last time, I'm always trying to give like a shout out now to a small business locally. Um, this time, I'm wearing a shirt, Stanley's Barbershop. Don't mind like my craziness right now. Uh, I've just been lazy. This haircut is not from Stanley's, but my previous three were. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks about the same when I go to Stanley's. It's a little more cleaned up because this was this was a hairdresser, so I look a little bit better from Stanley's because they got the straight razors. I love straight razors, and that's one of the reasons why I go there when I do decide to look presentable soon. Soon. All right. Thank you for joining thank you. me, guys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, until next time, Alex. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Oh, I'm happy I heard that beep. Yeah. Thank you guys for watching this episode of Let Me Ask You This. If you like this video, make sure you drop a like. Make sure you follow my Facebook and my Instagram. Let Me Ask You This to get all the information about the show and new episodes. Thank you guys. See you guys next time.